Praise the Lord. Welcome to Wednesday evening Bible study with the Apostolic Revival Tabernacle. We'll give everybody a moment to join in with us before we get started and uh, welcome you to this evening Bible study. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> As you join in, grab your Bibles if uh, you don't have it already. And, uh, we'll be taking our text from Acts chapter 9 verses 1 through 5 and then 1st John chapter 1 5 through 10 keep those in mind we are going to go to the Lord in prayer and as we do pray uh, let's remember sister Kelly she has lost her her brother and so we want to remember them in prayer her and her family in prayer in this it's a rough time of loss so let's remember Sister Kelly and Jamal and, and our prayers this evening. And then also continue to pray for Sister Tina's sister-in-law who is in need of the Lord to move upon her. Uh, along with that, I want to congratulate Sister Debbie Phillips for the addition of a grandbaby uh, into her family. So congratulations. God bless you on that. And we pray God's blessings upon those baby boys. Praise the Lord. As, uh, before we start Bible study, and you know, and as you join in with us, let's let's just bow our heads and, and just pray these special prayers for our uh, brothers and sisters uh, this evening. Lord, we thank you for this evening. Thank you for the opportunity to hear your word. Pray that you continue to move in service tonight, Lord. We pray special blessing upon Sister Kelly and her family. Lord, that you would uplift them, encourage them in this time of grieving to move upon them, Lord. Oh, precious spirit, that you would minister to their hearts and minds right now. And in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name we pray. Move upon Tina and her family and her sister-in-law. Lord, you know where they're at. You know the need of the body. We pray for healing right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, God, for the additions of grandbabies to Sister Phillips' family, Lord. We pray that you continue to bless them, Lord. Lord, all the unspoken requests that are made known as if, as we sit in our homes, our living rooms, we lift our hands, we pray that you would move and minister in those situations, that you would touch them. Thank you, God, for your great blessings. Thank you for your hand of protection and watchful eye on all that we do, Lord. We pray that you would anoint this Bible study, move upon these lips of clay, be able to minister to your people tonight. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, before we get into the lesson, I want to uh, remind everyone we are planning prayerfully to have in service uh, Sunday school at 11 on Sunday and then also 12 o'clock worship service. So, uh, barring uh, a blizzard, uh, and I hear some snow maybe coming our way, I don't know, but we certainly will let you know if it just Facebook Live if the weather is bad, but according, uh, uh, hoping, prayerfully, we'll have in-service service this Sunday. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, if you'd be so kind as to grab that Bible or your uh, reading utensil that you are going to use this evening, we're going to take uh, a look at Acts chapter 9, verses uh, 1 through 5. Uh, excuse me. Yes, one through five. I got two, two books here written down and I got confused. Yes, Acts chapter nine, verses one through five. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slander against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And 
And he trembling and astonished said, I'm sorry, I'm going to verse 6, excuse me. Trembling and said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Let's turn over to 1 John chapter 1, and I'll try to keep in my scripture verses that I had highlighted in your mark here. Uh, sometimes I get reading, I just, you know, just don't want to stop. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. John writes, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. This evening, I just want to bring uh, to you living in the light. Living in the light. And certainly, our Apostle Paul learned how to live in the light. Living in the light of the glory of the Lord, it pushes the darkness of the presence of the world back out of our lives. And it allows us to see our, our walk through our life as God sees it, full of sin. Yes, full of sin. Knowing our sins, it gives us a chance to seek forgiveness and to be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Praise the Lord. Walking in the light, it does push back the darkness. But because there's darkness surrounding us and it's pushed back, does, does not mean that our sins are totally gone. It just simply allows us to view our life that we might be able to come to a place of repentance and allow the Lord to wash us and cleanse us from our sins. You know, uh, you ever wonder about the deer in the headlights? Every time I read this story about uh, the Apostle Paul and his conversion I often think uh, of situations such as this. On 550, the road I take into work uh, every day, I have to be watchful early in the morning for the deer that may try to uh, get into my path. I remember one time going in and going across the bridge and then all of a sudden I seen about 8 to 12 glowing yellow eyes with a little black ball right in the middle of it just peering uh, up at me and I thought, oh Lord, I hope they decide to stay where they're at. Well, I, they did and they froze, but they couldn't go anywhere. And, and so have you ever wondered, as smart as deer are, they, they seem to know when it's uh, hunting season and they're scarce, they're going to go into hiding. Or they are, are so smart that they can smell you from miles away or they can feel, feel the fear as you uh, or anxiety as you begin to portray that anxiety or excitement. They can sense that. It's, it's amazing to me that they are so smart and intelligent in some ways, but in other ways you drive a car and they can't get out of the way, out of the middle of the road of a speeding car that's coming their way. Well, there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is God created them uh, with their eyes to have their eyes to dilate. And so when there's minimal light, just the faintest of light, their eyes will dilate to a point that they would be able to see in the dark, see where they're going. So when a big flash of light shines on them, it just paralyzes them and they freeze and they and they can't move. So that's that's kind of what saved me that morning as they stood there and they was paralyzed by my bright lights. They just couldn't move. Thank God they weren't in the middle of action or moving into the middle of the road. <clears throat> but 
you know, when we begin to think of Saul's moment of blindness, he, be, he began to be seized up by what was happening. The moment of blindness in his life is overzealousness. He was sold out to the cause. He was placed himself before the, the, the Sanhedrin. And he was full of this hate and this rage and, and desire to do something to his people that he thought was bringing blasphemy uh, to the temple and, and to the law. And he, he wanted so much to stop them. And it, it didn't take a, a, a whole lot to set him aflame and so he was on his way God then pierces him with this shining light you see he was he, he was doing his nature's bid his eyes were dilated and then all of a sudden God's shining light freezes him stopping him humbling him changing him right there at the moment saving him so that one day he would be able to go to the Ephesian church and be able to tell them for ye were sometimes Darkness, but now ye are light and work as the children of light. So, what actually is light? Have you ever, ever thought of what powers the elements in the light bulb or, or the natural light? Uh, according to the Britannica, light just simply means electromagnetic radiation that can be detected by the human eye. It's, it's the natural or man-made light that shines. And if you ever notice a candle, you can light a whole entire room with one flame of a candle. Now, you may not be able to see or, or be able to really read things, but you can tell the, uh, the room and, and what's in the room. It, it pierces the darkness and it, and it moves it out of the way so you'll be able to see the illumination of that light that is shining. Now light, uh, we nowadays know it as fiber optics. We use fiber optics either for laser or communications. And all it is, is different glassware in a fine uh, uh, cable. And it breaks down those lights and it makes it so much that it could be dangerous. It could actually burn a hole through you. That's how much they can break down those lights. And, and light is a very powerful entity when we begin to perfect it and hone it in upon our lives. It's the same way with the Lord. It's a very powerful and effective method of salvation when we begin to hone ourselves, our desires in on what God wants and has planned for us. Now, in Scripture, light begins with God speaking it simply into existence and it goes all the way through to revelation as it begins to surround the throne of god it identifies the lord as light god is light isaiah would admonish the house of jacob to walk in the light of the lord he would also begin to write the lord shall be thine everlasting light micah would refer to the lord as the Lord shall be a light unto me. The New Testament identifies Jesus as the light, the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Jesus, Jesus would call himself the light. And, and John chapter 9 verse 5 says, I am the light of the world. So how can we walk in the light? Well, Jesus gives us the answer to that in John chapter 8. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. So to walk in the light simply is to believe upon Jesus Christ and to follow him uh, throughout his call upon your life. We see this in, as, a, as the example through the life of Saul. We simply know him as Saul right now. A man who had seen the light and then believed on Jesus and followed him. And then it changed everything about him. His name, his ministry, 
uh, the people that he even preached to, it changed his audience. It changed everything about this man of the Sanhedrin. Saul was a persecutor of the church. He was a committed enemy to the cause of Jesus Christ. Yes, he was committed. He was an enemy to this cause. Now, you've got to remember his name is Saul. And he was also committed to get those who believed in this name. He was the Pharisee. He was known as the Pharisee and, and, and one told about uh, by Jesus. In fact, in Matthew chapter 3, wherefore, behold, I send you prophets, wise men, scribes, some of them ye shall kill and crucify. Some shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. Saul was also one of those who Jesus told his disciples about in John chapter 16. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth uh, you will think that he doeth God's service. Sorry, the new technology has failed me. So let me get back. Praise the Lord. There were others like Saul, uh, along with Saul, who were convinced they knew the true and living God. And they did. They knew who God was. They knew who Jehovah was. But it was this Jesus, this name of Jesus, that they was having problems with. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me, is what Jesus would explain to his disciples. So our first sight of Saul, we get to see him in action as he begins to look upon Stephen's stoning. Now Stephen is known as the first martyr of the gospel of Jesus. And so we see Saul as he's holding and watching over the clothing of those who are stoning Stephen to death. This great uh, prophet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Saul consented to this type of action. And he would continue it to make havoc of the church, as I quote in scripture, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison in Acts chapter 8. Uh, Acts chapter 26, it's recorded that uh, Paul uh, was confessing to Agrippa saying, I verily thought of myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And, and being uh, exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Paul said, I chased him as far as I could. I really believed I was doing the work of, of Jehovah. He began to bring threatenings and murder against uh, the Lord's disciples. He began to destroy those who were called by the name of Jesus. His actions began to put fear in the hearts of those who knew of his reputation. So if he was in the early church. And you've seen the Saul of Tarshish who was heading your way. You definitely wanted to be in a prayer meeting or out of the way. Because he, he had a reputation of beating you up or killing you or throwing you into prison. And there's probably no certain uh, uh, venue. He, he just probably went by the way he felt at that moment. So it was Saul's intent to make his way to Damascus. Maybe he heard about a great revival that was breaking out in Damascus and, or a revival of this name of Jesus. Maybe there was a lot of Jesus name of people that were preaching this gospel, this blasphemy that was coming against Yahweh. And he had to go and take care of business. It didn't matter if it was male or female. He, would, he was blinded by uh, his own thoughts, his own uh, ways and and he was, he was going to return them to Jerusalem that they might be able to face the punishment uh, that was seen fit by the Sanhedrin. Why? Because they preached the name of Jesus. Now Paul 
would give a self a description of his past in Acts chapter 22, verses 4 through 5. I persecuted them unto death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. I received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem to be punished. Saul's conversion is nothing short of miraculous. When he left for Damascus, there was no other thought, no other intention, but to take care of business for Jehovah in his mind. He had no thoughts to be able to put his faith Much less even give thought to think that he would be transformed into, listen to this part, a defender of what is now known as Christianity. A defender for the cause of Christ. Man, he started out one way, but somehow he was changed. The only thing he knew before he left Jerusalem was the belief that Jesus was the Messiah had to be stopped. That type of teaching, that type of theology had to be stopped. It was filtrating into those of Jehovah's followers. Somehow, these people had got it into their mind that this Jesus was the mighty God. That this Jesus was the everlasting Father. The very one that you would offer the sacrament and the atonement of sin. That they was, they was blaspheming everything that he had known and loved so much. So as Saul made his way and began to travel, he draws near to Damascus. And then something very radical begins to happen. A change in the atmosphere happens. Not because he was searching, not because he wanted some new identification. He, he didn't even plan on this. He didn't even pray about being a believer in Jesus. It was because the Lord had chosen him to take the name of Jesus to the Gentiles, to the kings, to Israel itself, to his people. You know, sometimes there are those that just don't uh, have any idea that the path that they're walking, God has si simply saved you because he desired and called you to go another direction. He wasn't even looking for a pathway in the cause of Christ, but now you find yourself being dealt with by this voice that's come and tugging at your heart. Could I tell you to simply answer the prayer, answer the call? The very man who caused many to suffer and die for their faith in Jesus, now he would suffer for this very same Jesus. Hallelujah. It was near to noon when this brilliant light began to shine from heaven, and the Bible would begin to tell us it struck him to the ground. It was a, a light just as bright, maybe even brighter than the sun itself. And then out of that brightness came a voice, a voice that called him by name, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now, I've, I've built up the story and the foundation of how this man didn't even want to believe in Jesus. There was definitely a divide amongst his belief. He thought it was blasphemy. Christ Jesus, it, it was nothing. It was a farce. But now he is simply hearing a voice from heaven. And, and so he cries out to the only one he knows. And he says, who art thou, Lord? Who, who are you? What, what is this that I'm, I'm feeling? Saul, being a devout Jew, and, and taught the strict version of the law of Moses, the being zealous for God according to the way he had been taught, calling himself the Hebrews of Hebrews. He was at the top. Uh, he was the uh, ultimate of living uh, for Jehovah. He was the ultimate Pharisee. There was no denying where he stood. His zealousness in his walk for uh, the temple and for the things of God uh, was his righteousness for the law. And he was righteous as far as he was concerned and blameless. But now he's coming to know this bright light 
shining upon him. And he begins to ask the question, who are you, Lord? And Paul, in fact, uh, Paul would begin to tell in the Philippians chapter 3, Paul would be begin to refer to the righteousness that he had before, him, before knowing and believing in Jesus. He would refer to it as self-righteousness. I was caught up into myself, into my salvation, into what I could do, that I didn't make room to allow myself to be moved by the power of God because he was surrounded by God to see and have a vision. I had to have something changing in my life. You know, Saul, being this devout Jew, treasured the deep meaning of the law. In fact, one of those laws being in Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, one that Israel was taught from a small child. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You see, there was something going on in his mind when he began to think that Jesus was proclaiming himself as God. Because there's only one God. And Jesus is, is bringing blasphemy and he's teaching these people blasphemy because there's only one God. So now, in, his, in Saul's mind, there's only one God. I, I, I just can't have a, a thought of, of adding to the power of God because he's, he's Jehovah Jireh. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting Father. He's Yahweh. He, he's the all in all. And now Jesus is on the scene before encountering this bright light. He didn't see a place for Jesus in his passageway. But this voice that answered his question answered it just like this. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Wow. When we come to the revelation of who Jesus Christ really is, that he is the author and the finisher of our faith, that he is the first and the last of us, that the very word that was spoken from the beginning and spoke this light into existence uh, to the very light that shines around the throne of God in revelation. It's the same God. It's the only God. And his name is Jesus. He tells his own apostle, I am Jesus and you're persecuting me. Oh man, Saul began to tremble and began to be astonished. He didn't know what else to say. But then he begins to say, Lord, what will you have me to do. Now we notice that once Saul heard the voice of Jesus identify himself as Lord, there was an immediate acceptance of the divine revelation. At one moment, there's a non believer, then there's a total surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. What will you have me to do? Lord, here I am. What are you going to have me to do? And Saul was willing to do whatever his Lord required. Saul thought he was walking in the light. He thought he was doing God's service. He thought he was on a divine mission to destroy an error that had come the way of the temple or Jehovah or the law. And when he was stricken down by the one who wrote the law, the one who is the law, the one who took the law and applied it to his cross, who is Saul's true spiritual condition was exposed. The light shined upon his heart and the darkness moved that away. That which he could not see, he can see now. And he sees the error of his own selfish friends. This is God. God's in this. And then once the light shines upon the darkness of the light, and it's out of the way, and you can see the flaws of my walk, or I can see the error of my way that, Lord, I've tried it my way so many times now. Lord, I, I just want to do your will. I just want to do it because I see because you have shined a light so brightly upon me. You know, Jesus is the light of the world. And by faith, we must embrace this truth. So his light will shine on the darkness 
of our nature to reveal the sin that has been hidden. Yes, and I, I speak of hidden because there are things in our lives, our past, that will maybe work its way out. As you begin to have a deeper prayer with the Lord, as you begin to develop your relationship with the Lord, he begins to shine uh, that light in areas of your life that, hey, you don't need this. You're, you're addicted to this. Why don't you give this to me? Why don't you allow this? Or, or maybe you're affected by something and, and you can feel its darkness and you begin to pray and God begins to move and bolster and, and your life and give you boldness that you can conquer those situations that you're facing. That's that's moving in the light of God. That's a, allowing your salvation to work for you. Now, Paul, being a scholar of the Hebrew scripture, he, he would begin to quote Daniel, and he did in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. So what was it that God wanted Saul to do? As he began to ask, ask the question, what will you have me do, Lord? Uh, Saul was to find uh, Ananias. Ananias was uh, God's prophet or preacher at that hour in Damascus. And like Samuel, Saul answered, uh, or excuse me, and like Samuel, Ananias answered the prayer that God gives him. I am here, Lord. What is it? And God gives this precious man a vision. And he begins to show him a man with a, a street name the name of the man, and he begins to tell him exactly what he's going to do. And the Lord wants him to know what he's supposed to do. And that is the apostle Saul on, the, on the, uh, the street called Strength is to be born again of water and spirit and preach the message of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles and to those that he could reach. He was to receive his sight and salvation. Although the light had shown on Saul, the real change hadn't come yet. It was all in the natural at that moment. Now the real change was about to happen. Not until Ananias entered the house uh, would Saul really realize exactly what was happening. Because the same time that the Lord was giving Saul his vision of Ananias, and you do what he is bid you to do. He's going to lay his hands on you. He's going to pray for you, and you receive what he has for you, and then you go about and, and get yourself baptized, and, and you do the work that I've called you to do. He, God had already planned all this for both men. How awesome that is. Because Ananias, by all rights, could have feared the Lord. In fact, he would ask the question, Lord, do you realize who this man really is? Do you know where you're sending me? I've already talked to him. Just as I'm talking to you, you're willing to go and preach the message. You know, some of us, we just need to allow the Holy Ghost to give us that boldness to go wherever it is God has directed our paths and, and give the message. And once the message is given, the light begins to shine and God begins to move. Hallelujah. And so as Ananias enters into the dwelling place where Saul is at, he begins to lay his hands on him, and he begins to pray the prayer, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus. Now listen to this. Even Jesus. The Lord simply wanted this man, Saul, to know that, yes, it is Jesus that is transforming your thinking right now. That appeared unto you in the way thou camest, hath sent me that you might receive thy sight and be filled with with the Holy Ghost. And immediately Saul's sight was returned to him and he was baptized. How great is that? How mighty is that? How glorious is that? Praise the Lord. And I'm almost to the end and it cut out on me. Hallelujah. Save our souls, our hearts, and our minds, our lives, and begin. 
begin to move in a realm as the light begins to shine upon us. Now serve us. I'm thankful for the mover that I am. Because I'm thankful for what he has done and, and, and given to us. We can be the light of the world. A city set up on a hill. Hallelujah. And certainly in this time and hour, we give refuge and we, we give hope to those that are hopeless. We're living in a world that is hopeless. And we're living in hopelessness today. But we have the hope of Christ. We have the hope of eternity. We have the light that shines in the midst of darkness. Living in the light. Let's live in the light today. Let's live in the light. Praise the Lord. Let's remember our services coming Sunday. Thank you for joining in with us. And uh, God bless you. Let's, let's pray a prayer of dismissal right now. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your house to hear your word. I pray that you would move upon it, touch it, and allow it to grow in our hearts. We thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name.